So I hope that you are continuing to trust in Him, look to Him, uh, continue to follow Him. I think in these days, we as believers, if you are a true believer, a true follower of Christ, uh, you need to be drawing closer than you ever have. Uh, we know in the midst of these days, uh, we need a stronger faith. Uh, we need a greater commitment to prayer, a greater commitment to Him. And so I hope that you will take advantage of what God is allowing to go on to get our attention. And so you just keep looking to Him. And I just want to remind uh, that we do have some of the things in the back. There are some masks back there. Someone needs a mask. Uh, there are the bracelets and the stickers. And uh, so if you put on one of the bracelets or one of the stickers, you're just letting folks know I don't want to shake hands I don't want to be too close I want my space and it's not that you're being rude it's not that you're being grumpy or grouchy you just want to be safe and because we know that that distance provides some safety and so if you have those things on uh, make sure that if you don't have one on that you respect those that do and so you just give give some space and just want to make sure everyone stays healthy and stays safe in these days and then of course do remember our Sunday night service will be here uh, tonight at six o'clock and then also our Wednesday night we have been meeting on Wednesday nights at seven uh, for prayer service and we've had two very strong very 
powerful prayer meetings on Wednesday night. And so I hope that you will come and join us there. Uh, this Wednesday night we'll be praying through the 23rd Psalm. And we know that is a very powerful psalm, a very strong psalm, a psalm that has much help and hope. And no doubt I think there's just great power that God allows to come through that psalm. So we will be going through that psalm and praying that psalm uh, Wednesday night. So y'all just keep remembering one another. Where'd Brother David go? Oh, fun. Mr. Ben, come pray for us. Does he have any announcements? Yes. $20 for non-members. Okay. And also, if if you want to donate your proceedings from the whatever you sell, you don't have to pay for the spot. Also. Yes. Let us pray. Your grace is heavy, Father, Lord. I thank you for this day. I thank you for all that is gathered here today, Lord. I pray, Lord, you give preacher Andy the words today, Lord. I pray you lift all the sick and all the hungry, Lord. I pray, Lord, you just be with this world as we go through this pandemic, Lord. Let us come closer to you, Lord, and keep us strong in the faith, Lord, and keep us in your path of righteousness, Lord. In your gracious, most heavenly name, amen. Amen. Now we are going to sing, Since Jesus Came Into My Heart. Uh, but what we're going to do while we stand and while we sing, uh, these boys, they're going to have their mask on, and they're going to come around and take up the offering. So if you have any offering, uh, you can place it in one of the buckets that these boys have. I got one here, Andrew. And uh, So if you'll stand, we're going to sing.
you so much. We know that that is the best day of anyone's life. Is whenever Jesus enters into that life and begins that transformation that only He can do. And what a blessing that is. And so now, I know it's been a while since we've done this, uh, but we're going to have our children. So if all of our children would come forward, we're going to let them take up their offering, and then they will then they will go to a children's church. And the buckets, the buckets right here. Here comes the man. Since we've done that, the kids never forgot what they was doing. They just <laughs> oh, that's about the best I've laughed all week. So that was pretty good. But we do want to remind us, you know, we do that. Uh, all the change that the children take up, it goes for the children's fund. Uh, but it also uh, is a blessing to our heart as adults to see those kids and uh, see their energy and the smiles. And then, of course, that helps them to be a part of our service. Uh, we want our kids. We don't want this. You know, many times when kids grow up, they go to mama's church or daddy's church. I want this to be their church. Yeah, this, this is their church. And so we want them to be involved in all the things that are going on. And so I know it's not much, uh, but I do appreciate all y'all that do give uh, change uh, just to help these kids, encourage them, because uh, they are important. They are important. All right, now we have another special gift today. 
down. <laughs> this is what happens sometimes to old folks. They have to use a walker. <laughs> they need a little help. Now I want to tell you about this song. It's an interesting story. In 2016, Dottie Rambo, who wrote this song, flew with her family to Holland for concerts. Now, the young driver that met her at the airport said, told her that they don't want to hear about the cross of Jesus. They don't want to hear about the blood he shed. He said, don't do that. And she said, well, you know, if you don't tell anybody that you told me that, I will I pretend that I don't know it and I will but we will sing about the cross of Jesus and the blood he shed tonight so at the concert that night they were weeping there was weeping in the auditorium and she so when she went to bed that night she lay in bed she had a um, vision. She had a vision and said, and when she woke up the next morning, she wrote this song. It says, I will weep no more for the cross he bore. I will glory in the cross.
have a rehearsal, so. <laughs> but anyway, thank you. <laughs> All right. I had to stick this in here. In here. Tell them again your age. 85. 85. I have, I have one good eye. My, my, uh, my right ear eye is damaged. So I have one good eye, and I'm 85 years old. 85. And the Lord has let me live this long, and I'm thankful to the Lord. Amen. <laughs> and for years she sung music, led choirs, taught yeah. music. The Lord's used her many ways through the years. Yeah. And still working through her. Still working through her. Thank you. Thank You're you so welcome. Much. I'm just going to sit on here, and then I'll go to play. Hey, Nick, turn off these mics. Thank you, sir. Well, we know that it is a blessing and an honor to be able to serve our Lord Jesus Christ. We know that none of us are really worthy uh, to even say his name, but he gives us opportunity. He gives us opportunity to serve him. He gives us opportunity to be a witness for him. Uh, he's the one that gave his life. He done all the suffering. Uh, so that we could have that experience of Christ and what a blessing that is. And we know that God gives us that opportunity to have that relationship with Him. And I know some of you have heard or read, studied about George Mueller, uh, but I just want to remind you of some of the things about him. Uh, he has been described by many as probably one of, if not the greatest prayer warrior since Bible time. And so he lived in the 1800s, actually from 1805 to 1898, and he was a prayer warrior. And I mean, he knew, he understood prayer. Uh, he did pray, uh, no doubt spending hours each day uh, bowed before the Almighty. Uh, but he was a director, uh, actually established uh, an orphanage. He was the director of Ashley Down Orphanage in Bristol, England. And he was also the founder of 117 Christian schools. Uh, he was able to go there and uh, establish all these Christian schools. He had a heart for the children, a heart for the gospel. Uh, one thing that's interesting about him, whenever he was a youth, he was very worldly, very wild. And uh, he knew the ways of the world. He had his family had some wealth, and uh, he was accustomed to that. And he himself uh, done some things that really weren't legal uh, to advance his own financial 
success. Um, but one day, uh, he had a friend that invited him to an in-home prayer service. And so he went to that home, and he experienced that environment, and he began to realize that there was something real about that. And it wasn't long. He gave his heart to the Lord, and he became transformed. And whenever you hear, I know, have you ever heard the, the phrase, sold out, sold out for Christ? George Mueller was sold out. I have never met anyone that was sold out as much as George Mueller. I mean, he was completely sold out to Christ. I'm not going to tell his whole story, uh, but he had tremendous faith. He had tremendous dedication to Christ. And in his autobiography, he states that he had over 5,000 requests. He, he, he kept a very detailed prayer journal. And he says he has over 5,000 requests answered. He had more than that answered. He had more than 5,000 requests, prayer requests answered. But, but this, this is what he said. He states he had over 5,000 prayer requests answered on the day that he prayed them. When was the last time you had a prayer request answered the very day that you prayed it? I've, I've read some of those, some of that prayer journal, and uh, I'm just one of them that sort of stood out to me in my mind. Uh, he had that big orphanage. All of these kids and children were dependent upon him, his wife, and that orphanage. And his wife came to him after supper one evening and told George, Honey, we do not have any milk left over for the children for breakfast. George said, Well, let's pray about it. They got down on their knees when they arose from prayer. There was a knock on the door, and someone had given them funds, and they took that funds and went and purchased some milk. That's power. When was the last time you prayed for milk? <laughs> I was. I, the re, I guess the reason that one request stood out in my mind, I've never had. I've, I've never been in a position to where I had to pray for my next meal. I've never been in a position where I did not know where my next meal was coming from. All of my life, there's been food in the cabinet. There's been food in the fridge. There's been the opportunity to run to McDonald's and get a Big Mac. I mean, all of my life. And so, I mean, all, all those prayers, a lot of these prayers that he prayed were they were desperate. I mean, they, they did not know where the next meal were coming from. And you can read some of those requests that there was several times where uh, the, boil, the, the, the heater, the boiler room uh, had messed up. And, and then there was a time whenever there was something happened and there were some leaks. And I mean, he would pray. And I know one time the fog lifted so that people would do some work. Uh, he prayed for that boiler. I mean, it, it, not only did milk supply come, I mean, he prayed and, and the weather would change. I mean, it, this man was a mighty man of God. He got there because of his sacrifice, commitment, dedication. But if you ever want to read or study about some wonderful, very mighty, very powerful prayer warrior, George Mueller would be a great example. This is what he said. He says, I live in the spirit of prayer. He says, I pray as I walk about, when I lie down, and when I rise up. And he says, and the answers are always coming. <laughs> That's exciting. <laughs> What's changed from then to now? He's still God. <laughs> he still has the power. He still has the authority. He's still on his throne. He still can speak and calm the storms. He still can provide. I mean, there's no change in God. The difference is in us, isn't it? 
There's no doubt that one of the great reasons why he was such a powerful prayer warrior is because there was great need. It was desperate times. 1800s, a lot of responsibility. And that's one of the one of the downfalls of the United States, one of the downfalls of Christianity in the U.S. We're just spoiled brats most of the time. I mean, we, we have got it made, every one of us. And I'm grateful for it. I mean, I, mean, I thank God for air conditioning. Whew, don't you love air conditioning? I mean, whew, I thank God for lights. I've told you before, my, I mean, I'm not scared of the dark. I like lights. I like it to be bright. I like to be able to see. I know me and my wife will walk into a restaurant from time to time, and the first thing she'll say, it's awful dim in here. It's awful dark in here. <laughs> we want to see what we're eating. Sometimes they turn those lights down, and you'll never know what they're going to feed you. But another, What I'm saying is we have been blessed. We have been blessed. God has blessed everyone here tremendously. We cannot allow that to keep us from being a people of prayer. I can assure you that all that's gone on in our nation in 2020 has increased a burden upon my heart to pray. And there's no doubt it is very evident that there are a few more in our church that through all that we have encountered as a nation, as people, there's been a greater burden for prayer. And so I call upon all that are here today. If you are saved, if you're born again, maybe even watching live stream, I challenge you. We need to be a people of prayer. We have entered in some situations where only God can move and make a difference. You know, there are times in our life whenever we are faced with problems and difficulty and we can actually do things to make a difference. And I tell you, I think God is putting us in a place where we're just going to trust Him. We're just going to have to have faith and confidence in Him. And I hope, I hope that you will allow Him, allow Him to be in that very exalted position in our heart. As I said, we've had some very strong prayer meetings on Wednesday nights, and I'm hoping and praying that will continue, and God will continue to work through those that gather and pray and call upon His name. And I do challenge you, uh, because just as George Mueller was definitely a prayer warrior, there is no doubt that there needs to be a increase in that today. <laughs> but there is a need for prayer warriors. A need for prayer warriors. If you are a true disciple, you're a person of prayer. You look at those disciples in the New Testament, they knew about prayer. They understood the, the importance of bowing before the Almighty and praying. And so here in Acts 16, there's three instances that we'll look at real quick. These three prayer meetings three opportunities to pray. You know, one thing about Paul, when you look at him and study his life, he had a life that was marked with prayer. Paul was a man of prayer. If you find someone that is a prayer, that is an exciting life. It's a challenging life. There are always things working, always things that God is accomplishing. If you have someone that has committed their heart and life to spending time in His presence, they will change. That Once we enter into His presence and we spend time there, there will be change in our life. And that's the main purpose of prayer is to change us. Because God needs us to be in a certain place, a certain position, so that He can work, so that He can answer those prayers. If I'm living in sin and living selfishly, you know what God's doing? He needs to work on me. And so whenever I begin to pray and I spend time in His presence, it puts me in the place where God can begin to allow those blessings to flow uh, for those around us. And so Paul, Silas, these men were tremendous prayers. Their life was exciting. It was challenging. 
And it was very rewarding. And so this very first prayer that you see here in Acts 16, well, let me just say verse 6 through 12, Paul is searching. Paul and Silas have begun this missionary journey, and you just see Paul, uh, he's just excited. He, he's got the truth, he's got the boldness, and he's ready to go, and he's ready to preach. And so you just sort of like one of them, a, a, a hunting dog is what I thought about. And so you remember, I remember going rabbit hunting. As a matter of fact, the last time I went was over here before they built all these houses. And there was a gentleman had some of those beagles, and you set those beagles loose, and those tails get to wagging, and they gone. I mean, they gone. I mean, they just, you said they just go off in different directions. And that's about the way Paul and Silas said they had got an opportunity. The gospel, and they just, they just went out the door. Let's go. Let's go preach. Let's go teach. Let's go share. Everywhere needed the gospel. Everybody needed the gospel. But God had a plan. God had a design. And so there were places that Paul and Silas wanted to go. And you can read here in Acts 16, if you look at verse 6, it said where they were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia. Verse 7, the Spirit suffered them not. And so there were places and areas that the Holy Ghost, that God would not allow them to go. It wasn't time. You can study Paul and later on he did go. But at this time, at this point, God had a plan. He had a purpose. And then when you get down to verse 9, you get to the Macedonia call. And I know most of us have heard that. They received the vision and where the man in Macedonia was saying, come over and help us. And so you have Paul searching, Paul looking for a place to spread the gospel. But that's, I think one of the things, that's just a reminder that this is not Paul's gospel. <laughs> Paul was a mighty man of God, but he's not God. This was his gospel, his plan, his purpose. And so whenever he sent out Paul and Silas, it wasn't to go where they wanted to go, to do what they wanted to do, to accomplish what they wanted to accomplish. They had to follow God. And I think sometimes even as adult Christians, as mature Christians, we need to be reminded of that, don't we? Now, this is not my church. This is not my plan. This is God's church. And it's God's plan. And so we must be sensitive to the direction of the Holy Ghost. Allow Him to lead us. Allow Him to guide us and to direct us. Whenever you have some like Paul and Silas that are on fire, that want to go, that's willing to go, I can assure you God will open the door. And so God opened the door for Paul and Silas. The Macedonian call. They were willing to serve. God opened the door. And then you get to Acts 16, verse 13. It says, On the Sabbath we went out of the city by riverside, where prayer was wont to be made. We sat down and we spake unto the women which resorted thither. And so here was Paul finally in the place where God had directed, where God had desired them to be. And he goes to where he knew there would be some that believed in God. And so we know that where he was, there was not a strong Jewish presence. For there to be a synagogue set up in a community, there had to be at least 10 faithful, committed Jewish men. And so where he was at this point, they did not have 10 faithful, strong Jewish men. So what the Jews of that community would do, since they did not have a synagogue to go to, they would find a place outside the city. And this happened not just here, but in other places. And they would gather there on the Sabbath, and they'd spend time joined in prayer. And so Paul knew that. And so he went down by the riverside, and most likely they even had some type of structure they could get under, and they would pray. They would pray during the week on their own, 
But they're on the Sabbath they would join together and they would pray together, find encouragement, find hope. Maybe even share what has went on in their life that week. And so here you have Paul and Silas are traveling, missionary journey. And as they go, they go here by the riverside. And they begin to minister. And they meet this one that had faith in God, that understood the Old Testament. Lydia, she's described as being a seller of purple. It says in verse 14, And a certain woman named Lydia, that seller of purple, the city of Thyatira, she worshiped God. She heard us. Her heart, the Lord opened. And she attended unto the things which were spoken of Paul. And so Lydia, being a seller of purple, she was a business lady. Most likely a wealthy lady. And she loved God. And so on the Sabbath, when it got time to pray, she put her business to the side. Her business was important. Her business was crucial. But when it got time to pray, she went to go pray. You know, that's a pretty good example, isn't it? Sometimes we allow this life to overwhelm us, to overrun us. We must have our priorities straight. We must have our priorities where God wants them so that God can use us. Sometimes we begin to look at our life, hopefully, there are times when we examine our life and we begin to question, you know, where, where is God working? How is God working? Why is God not working? Sometimes the reason God's not working is because our priorities are messed up. We do not have God where He needs to be. I mean, if, if we truly went through this auditorium this morning, could we honestly say that God is where He should be in our life? Does He have the preeminence in our heart as He deserves? How are our priorities? Here, Lydia, businesswoman, no doubt an intelligent lady, successful lady, she had some priorities. And so she understood the value of putting God first. Just so happened, this gathering was going to be different than any gathering she'd been to before. She was there serving the God of the Old Testament. And now all of a sudden, here comes Paul with the message of the gospel that the Messiah he had come that he had given his life that he had rose that third glorious day that he had ascended into heaven and that we have gone from the time of the law to the time of grace that it is time for us to follow Christ and love Christ and give our heart and souls to him and so Lydia, she heard that gospel message, and the Lord was able to open her heart. She accepted that gospel. And one thing I love about Lydia, I mean, I love her faithfulness. I love her commitment. I love that she was willing to open up her heart and allow God to move in. But if you'll notice this next verse, verse 15, she was baptized in her household. So no doubt that's crucial. <laughs> She got saved, and she began to share. It affected her household. And I can tell you now, if you have folks in their home that begin to truly get right with God, it will have an impact. It will have an impact. Lydia began to impact her household. It says, Then she besought us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and abide there. And she constrained us. So as soon as she gets saved, she begins to minister. She begins to reach out to those missionaries, begins to have a desire to feed them, have a desire to place them in a place where they can find some protection. And so Lydia, Paul goes to pray. I tell you, we don't ever know what's going to happen whenever we go spend time in his presence. <laughs> this was a prayer that ministered. Whenever Paul was headed to this place of prayer, he didn't know exactly what was going to happen. There's no doubt he always had a desire for souls to be saved. No doubt he always had a desire to minister, but he didn't know what was going to take place. And so here, as they went to pray, as they went to gather, God began to move. Don't you believe we need some of those movements? We need some of those times. 
whenever God's people gather, whenever God's people commit their hearts and life to prayer and see God begin to move, see God begin to change hearts and change lives. This was a prayer that ministered. And not only did it minister to Lydia, but you can see that discipleship there. She got it. Paul shared it with her. And now she's beginning to do that training, do that teaching. You, you can see that. Because as soon as she got saved, she didn't, they didn't tell her how long she was there listening to Paul. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure there wasn't a prayer meeting like we have. Run in and run out. You ever go to a church meeting, prayer meeting, and what do you do? You looking at your watch. <laughs> how long? What? That preacher, he's long-winded. When he sit down, I got, I got some chicken waiting on me. I know you love chicken because you're Baptist, except one. I'm sure they spent some time, Paul, teaching, sharing, investing, putting into Lydia. And you can see very quickly, Lydia began to make a difference. And those days are exciting, <laughs> but we also need to be reminded, reminded that all prayer is not easy, is it? So we have a prayer, we're going to pray, and that prayer ministered. But then right after that, they have a prayer that was hindered. Verse 16 said, It came to pass as we went to prayer, they was going to pray, a lot of praying going on in Paul's life. <laughs> as we went to prayer, a certain damsel possessed with a spirit of divination met us, which brought her masters much gain by soothsaying. Said the same followed Paul and us and cried, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, which show unto us the way of salvation. Well, that sounds pretty good, don't it? I mean, you got Paul and Silas, they're spreading the gospel, and all of a sudden you got some young lady, a damsel that's following them, and look what she's calling out. She says she's following, and she's saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God. What would you do if you went out to visit? You went out to witness, and as you walk through Walmart, or as you walk down the road from house to house, there was somebody come up behind you. You didn't know who they was. And they begin to shout, Y'all listen to this great person. For they're servants of the Most High God. You'd be like, Yes, I am. Yes, I am. Y'all listen to her. She knows what she's talking about. I mean, at first glance, that sounds pretty good, doesn't it? But when you go back and you look at that day and that time, look what Paul, Paul didn't applaud what she was doing. Paul didn't welcome what she was doing. Verse 18 says, She did this many days. Paul, being grieved, he turned and said to the Spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out the same hour. There were some maybe that were there that thought she was doing God's work. But Paul recognized immediately that it was of the devil. And you go back in that day and that time, a lot of false gods. You've heard of Zeus, haven't you? <laughs> Whenever she was using the words that she was using and saying the phrases that she was uh, saying, what she was doing, she was saying, these are people are sent from Zeus. <laughs> these people are sent from false gods. These people have a message from a false god. And so in that day and time when that lady was proclaiming what she was proclaiming, the people that were hearing, they were not hearing the truth. They were not hearing about Jesus. They were hearing about a false God and a false power and a false hope. And so Paul finally fed up with it. And I find it interesting that Paul put up with it for a little while. That's interesting to me. That at the very beginning, Paul didn't just stand up and say, all right, get out of here. He sort of put up with it a little while. And finally, after many days, he cast out that demon. And so this prayer meeting, there were some hindrances. I mean, here was Paul and Silas trying to spread the gospel, trying to make a difference, and there were some hindrances, and there are hindrances in prayer. Sometimes it's not God's will. Many times we're so selfish, God can't work. Sometimes it's a lack of faith. 
You know, the Bible teaches us if we don't forgive, God won't forgive us. And so we that there are hindrances to prayers. And I can assure you, whenever you bow before the Almighty and you spend time praying and those answers don't come, we need to evaluate our own heart because something's wrong. There may need to be some changes in our life. Those bad relationships. The Bible speaks about a relationship between a, a husband, a wife, and even other relationships, how that interferes with our prayer life. And then, of course, sin. Sin interferes. There are scripture after scripture that describes the hindrances to prayer. Do we even know any of them? You want to be a strong prayer warrior, you better know some of the verses about praying. You better understand some of the things that keep us from allowing God to work through us to accomplish great things. You know, we use that phrase, and I've heard that phrase all my life, a prayer warrior. There have been those that are part of our church that were prayer warriors. It's not a prayer sissy. It's not a part-time prayer position but a prayer warrior doing battle in prayer, battling sin, battling Satan, battling self. I tell you, you got a prayer warrior. There's battle in that prayer life. There's something that needs to be accomplished, and we don't stop until it gets accomplished. What kind of warrior would there be if he didn't put forth all that energy to go forth and defeat, go forth and win victory? I can tell you now, in our day, there's so many believers that do not continue until they, as we say, pray through. <laughs> we just give up. Why? Because we're so comfortable. We've got it so made. I don't need God. I've got a nice car. I've got heat and air. I've got a water heater. I don't need Him. <laughs> I need some folks to put that aside. But I can tell you right now, church, there's some things going on in our world now. We need some folks that to get a hold of God. And real quick, I know I'm going to have time to do this next one, but just real quick, I'm going to read these verses. Here's a prayer that's fully surrendered. Paul and Silas, and I know you've read these, heard these. Verse 19, when their master saw that the hope of their gains were gone, they called Paul and Silas. Those people didn't care about that girl. All they cared about was their money. The Bible doesn't say if she got saved. I believe she did. If you delivered from that situation, I believe she went on and got saved. Now, we don't know. Paul and Silas, they caught them in the marketplace, brought them to the magistrates. Verse 21, they accused them of teaching customs which are not lawful for us to receive. Verse 22, the multitude rose up together against them. The magistrates rent off their clothes, commanded to beat them. When they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely. Paul and Silas stood for truth. Paul and Silas stood for righteousness. They preached the gospel. That was rejected. Sometimes we don't want to go and do because we're afraid somebody's going to laugh at us. I mean, here, Paul and Silas, all they was doing was telling folks how to get saved. All they was doing was spreading the gospel. And it interfered with their money, of course. They didn't just try to run them out of town. They caught them. They beat them. Many stripes. Talk about suffering for the gospel. Paul and Silas understood suffering for the gospel. In our day and time, we don't suffer for the gospel anymore. When, when was, if ever, a time that you truly suffered for Christ? You want to know why the church is so weak in America? We don't suffer. We don't understand suffering. We don't want suffering. We will not suffer. We won't do it. I mean, it's, it's all we can do to get folks back on Sunday nights. Wednesday nights. Have, have you ever truly suffered for Christ? Have you sacrificed for Christ? Paul and Silas, they knew suffering for the gospel. And it's caused us to be so weak, so immature, so foolish, so flaky. Up one day, down the next. All based on what? Do we have what we want? Do we have what we want? Paul and Silas, they put their selves to the side. 
I don't care. <laughs> they was willing to suffer. I've never had been beaten for the faith. I just wanted us to see a little bit about who these guys were. Verse 24, who having received such a charge, they thrust them into the inner prison, made their feet fast in the stocks. We read by that very quick. The stocks in this day were spread apart, so their feet were out like this. Very painful. Didn't take long. Be a lot of pain, discomfort, suffering for Jesus. They put me and you there. We're going to be griping, complaining, crying out, God, why? I'm trying to serve you. I was trying to be faithful to you. And now you've allowed this to happen? When's the last time somebody said something to you, made you some mad, you just wanted to walk away? We won't put up with much suffering, do we? We say we're believers. We say we're followers of Christ. But I tell you, it don't take much to get our focus off of Him. And I'm not trying to be mean. I'm just being honest. It don't take much. One word, one action, and we'll turn our back on Christ. We'll turn our back on what He's called us to do. It don't matter. We'll just walk away. Paul and Silas didn't do that. They had beaten them many stripes. I can't imagine. I can imagine the pain that they're going through. Put them in the inner prison. Put those in their stocks that while they were there, it just began to be more and more painful. What did Paul and Silas do? Did they cry and wail and get mad and get angry? That's not what they did. Verse 25, at midnight, they'd been in those stocks long enough to go through much pain. They'd been in that prison long enough for the abuse to begin to have much I mean, they were in pain. At midnight, Paul and Silas, they prayed. <laughs> and they sang praises unto God. And the prisoners heard them. I don't know that I could have done that. To be honest, you don't know if you could have done that either. <laughs> After all that they've been through, after all that they encountered, locked up, and they just looked at each other <laughs> and said, what are you going to do? They'll say, I don't know what you're going to do. So I think I'm going to pray. <laughs> and they begin to pray. And they begin to call out to God. And they begin to lift their voice and praise God, thank you for allowing me to be beat. <laughs> what? Thank you for allowing me to be locked up. Thank you for allowing me to be suffered, suffering for you. To be a witness for you. And if you'll notice that last phrase, the prisoners heard them. If you look up the original language, when it says the prisoners heard them, it's not just here. It wasn't as though they were in the same room. Oh, I'm trying to hurry. Let me just tell just a few more things. Whenever I was young, able to go to prison ministry, went down to Columbia, preached to those prisoners, had that one opportunity. I was scared to death. I mean, I was a little teenager, hadn't been probably out of Whitestone. Went to that maximum security prison, and here I was. I was standing on top of these stairs, the big open room, two, two stories of prisoners, cell after cell. There I was trying to preach. They ain't no telling what I said. <laughs> ain't no telling. I don't know. They ain't no telling. But those, those guys heard. They heard. They had to hear. I mean, they, it ain't like they had Walkman. That they, could, they didn't have earbuds in that day. They didn't have nothing. They was in high security locked. I mean, they were there. They heard. That's not what this word means. This word here means they listened intently. They listened intently. Some of them in this prison, it wouldn't have been a big prison. But there's a chance that some of those folks have been there for a while. 
And you know as well as I do, for some of those that were locked up in the center prison, they had been beat, they had been exposed to what they were exposed to, you know what they're going to do? They're going to die. And so I'm sure that there's some in that prison that they saw folks put in there and what long they were dragged out. And don't you know that some of those that are put in there that are just cussing and fussing and angry and mad, I can't believe that this is going on and you just hear the hate and you can hear the anger. But all of a sudden you got some that are put in there and they have a totally different disposition. They're singing. And they're praising. And I don't know what they were singing, but they were giving testimony to the Almighty God. And because of their commitment, because of their sacrifice, because of their willingness, that jailer... <laughs> well, let me say this first. The, the, shook, the, the wall shook, doors opened, Paul and Silas, have it been us? You know what we done? Pew. I'm out of there. <laughs> I mean, if I pray that God deliver me... That's not what they was praying. It just says they were singing and praising. If I was there and I was praying, I'd be like, God, get me out of here. Get me out of here. They wasn't, I wasn't, they wasn't praying that. And so when the doors open, they're like, hey, I'm out. I'm out. And the jailer, scared to death, he's going to get killed. He's going to kill himself. Paul's like, whoa, whoa, slow down, slow down, slow down. It's all right. We still here. And that boy got saved, and his whole house got saved. So these, these three opportunities, at least, for prayer. Going to pray, one of them's interrupted, and then here, this last one, we see two guys that were fully surrendered. Another thing that's interesting about these verses, there was people that were changed, people that were impacted. Lydia had a soft heart. She got saved. This blind heart, we don't know what happened to her, but one thing I do know, she was delivered. She was delivered, and then you got this old hard heart, this hard-hearted jailer through this prayer. There was change. There was change. I was going to read several things, but I'm going to read one. R.A. Torrey, another great man of prayer in the past. I've been reading his book this week. And he goes through some of the reasons why we should pray. Because there is an enemy. Because it's God's appointed way. Jesus set the example. And even in his present ministry, you know what Jesus is doing? He's pleading on my behalf. So even now, Jesus is praying. But a verse that, 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 that I've heard a lot, and you have too, because I've quoted it. Hebrews 4, 16, and listen. I know it's time to go, but this is worth your trip this morning, if you'll, if you'll listen to this. Hebrews 4, 16. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace. What is that? That's praying. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace. Boldly. <laughs> spending time there. Commitment. Come boldly to the throne of grace. Why? that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. You've heard that verse a lot. How has that verse ever affected you? I've read it a lot. To be honest with you, and I'm just being open, that's what we try to do around here. I can't, I can't honestly say that that verse has ever truly, really impacted my prayer life. It should. You know what R.A. Torrey said about this verse? And listen, listen to what he's saying. He said, The measure of our appropriation of grace is determined by the measure of our prayers. Is that not amazing? And it's based on that verse. Come boldly to the throne of grace to obtain mercy. To obtain grace. You want to obtain mercy? You want to obtain grace? You need to spend time on your knees. I apologized several weeks ago to this church. And I'll do it again in case somebody wasn't here. There was a time in my ministry where I was just trying to get people to pray. 
And I stood right here in this pulpit and I tried to encourage you to take 10 minutes in the morning to pray. And I tried to encourage you to take 15 minutes in the morning or at night. I mean, we're busy people. I said, that's wrong. That's not sufficient. There are folks dying and going to hell. We need to spend time praying. We have family members that are separated from the Almighty God. And we don't care enough to spend time bowed before Him in prayer. I don't know about you, but I need grace. And I need mercy. And this verse teaches me that it's available. But i got to spend time in prayer. And I'm going to hit some of our seniors now. We have some of our sweet seniors. You've spent your life working. You've spent a lot of time committed, working. Now you're retired. I beg of you. This church needs you to spend time in prayer. I beg of you to take advantage of some of the time that you have. Pray for me. I need your prayer. Pray for this church. Pray for this nation. We have multitudes of those that have time on their hand and do not spend time in prayer. I challenge you, if you have time, to pray. I challenge you, if you don't have time, to pray. <laughs> Make time. There are some that work. I, I know all about it. I pastor a church and I work too. There's a lot, of, a lot of time constraints, a lot of pressure. But I believe fully until we as God's people take time to spend in His presence, we're still going to stay in the mess we're in. You look back at the history of the church, great movements of God, great power comes because people spend time in prayer. Spend time in prayer. I'm asking you to stand. Y'all gonna come play? Can you play? Just play something for us. Lord, we do bow in your presence. I just pray that somehow you take these words that I've spoke this morning, the scripture that I've read, and God somehow put a great burden upon my heart and a burden upon those that are gathered here, those that may be listening. God, we need to spend time in your presence. We need to spend time humbly bowed before you, seeking your face, seeking your grace, seeking your mercy, seeking your direction. Lord, for lo too long in my life and too long in the life of those that are gathered here, we've spent time trusting in ourselves, leaning upon our own understanding, trusting in our own wealth, trusting in our own supply. God, it's time that we as your people begin to trust in you. That we begin to look to you. And Lord, we know that we as your people, we got to spend time in your presence. And Lord, I know that that's not easy. There's a lot going on. But Lord, there's nothing more important. Nothing. There's nothing in this life more important in spending time with you. So Lord, put that burden upon my heart and upon the heart of those that are here. And Lord, we pray this in your most holy and blessed and perfect name. Amen. If you need to bow this altar, we're going to take just a moment just to call upon him. Ms. McCallie is going to play for us.